Cosbrillig and the slithy toves did gyre and gimble in the wave. Oh, Mimsy were the borogoves and the momras outgrave. Beware the jabberwock, my son, the jaws that bite, the claws that catch. Beware the jump jab bird and shun the frumious bandersnatch. He took his vorpal sword in hand. Long time the manxome foe he sought. So rested he by the tum-tum tree and stood a while in thought. And as in uffish thought he stood, the jabberwock with eyes of flame came whiffling through the tulgy wood and burbled as it came. One, two, one, two, and through and through the vorpal blade went stick a snack. He left it dead, and with its head he went galumphing back. And hast thou slain the jabberwock? Come to my arms, my beamish boy. Oh, frabjous day, kaloo, kalay, he chortled in his joy. T'was brillig, and the slidey toves did gyre and gimble in the wave. Oh, mimsy were the borogoves, and the bone rats out grave. Hello, good evening. I'm Brian Sibley and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this Zoom meeting of the Lewis Carroll Society and an evening of Stuff and Nonsense. You will all have recognised that poem, Jabberwocky, without question one of Lewis Carroll's most celebrated verses. And as I'm sure you know, Jabberwocky appears in Through the Looking Glass and What Alice Found There, which was first published 150 years ago this year. Tonight we're marking that sesquicentennial celebration with nonsense first chosen and read by members of the Lewis Carroll Society and some very special guests who I'll be introducing you to as we go along. You know there's actually nothing new about nonsense verse. The Greek poet Lucilius writing circa 500 AD wrote this little rhyme. Little Hermogenes is so small, he can't reach anything down at all. Though it's on the ground, he must let it lie, for he's so short that it's still too high. And another of his uh, four-line rhymes, look at Marcus and take warning. Once he tried to win a race, ran all night, and in the morning hadn't passed the starting place. Well, we'll get things started with another well-known piece of Carolian nonsense first, this time from Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, and the first of our guests, actor Kevin Moore. Lovely to have you with us, Kevin. Uh, has given, I don't know how many performances you've given of this uh, play, One Man Show, written by David Horlock, called Crocodiles in Cream, but you've immersed yourself in doing that production and playing Lewis Carroll across many productions over many years. What is it for you that ha is the appeal of these stories and verses and what, why have they endured so much, do you think? Well, he, <clears throat> he's a marvellous writer, yes. Marvellous characters. Yeah. Uh, uh, and they're a great joy to play. I mean, I think that's why it's gone on for children. He never talked down to them. It's never cute, is it? And, and, and Alice has quite a rough time, doesn't she? I mean, with the caterpillar, with the Cheshire cat. And, Griff and mocked her, they're all perfectly fouled. <laughs> but she holds her own. Um, and I think because it, it, he never said to kids, keep up, did he? I mean, they came up to that and they understood it. And I think that's, that's I don't think there's another writer, not, not Barry, though in the same neck of the woods, isn't he? But I don't think there's another writer like him who writes as well and keeps the story cracking along, doesn't he? And, and what is it about them, do you think, Kevin, that makes whether you're a professional performer, as you are, or whether you're an amateur or reading to your children or just reading aloud to yourself, what is it that makes us, about these verses and stories, that they seem to want to be read aloud? It's, it's like we, we want to hear them. It's not just reading that we want to hear them. It's a golden opportunity but to show off and do different voices and different characters. Uh, yeah, they, they cry out to be done, don't they? Now, I tell my favourites are the Griffin and the Walrus. I love those two. Well, my my uh, my next question for those who don't know, I'm sure m most Carolians do, but not everybody may know. Where did the title of uh, David Horlock's play "Crocodiles in Cream" come from? Well, it comes from Sylvie and Bruno, which I've never managed to get through. Have you? <laughs> 
Uh, yes, you all have. I haven't. Um, uh, and I, 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 I looked up. And if I hadn't, Kevin, if I hadn't, I wouldn't admit it on this particular. This program. <laughs> Perhaps I shouldn't have done that. But um, um, I, I looked it up to see where it was and still didn't make any sense in there. But um, it, it's something uh, people say, oh, it's a funny title. What does it mean? And, and so I tell them the poem. <clears throat> People sit watching the show, I think, and think, he hasn't mentioned crocodiles, crocodiles and cream yet. It's the interval. And you don't actually hear about crocodiles and cream until the end. And it's a poem. <clears throat> and David chose it because in a curious way, <clears throat> it is like Carol saying goodbye to things. You know, uh, 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 little birds are teaching tigresses to smile without guile, and that is the little girls. Little birds are writing interesting books to be read by crooks, and that's about his writing. Little birds are bathing crocodiles in cream like a happy dream, like but not so lasting. Crocodiles when fasting are not all they seem. Mm. And the very last verse is, uh, 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 little birds are tasting gratitude and gold, pale with sudden cold, pale I say, and wrinkled, when the bells have tinkled and the tale is told. And that's when the show blackout. It's like he is saying, "Bye bye, it's over." And I've, I've done all that I'm going to do in the way of storytelling. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. It makes uh, sense to me to get through that poem, particularly. Oh, now we're now we're going to hear crocodiles and cream. Well, you're going to read another about another crocodile cohort now, uh, as recited by Alistair herself in Wonderland. How doth the little crocodile? Okay. How doth the little crocodile improve his shining tail and pour the waters of the Nile on every golden scale? How cheerfully he seems to grin, how neatly spreads his claws and welcomes little fishes in with gently smiling jaws. Thank you, Kevin. Kevin will be back with us, uh, well, quite shortly, actually. Um, the illustration there for anybody who's interested uh, is by John Vernon Lord, and uh, he's not only welcoming the fishes in, but is uh, gently opening out his claws. Nonsense, of course, was not the exclusive literary province of Lewis Carroll, aka Charles Lutwitz Dodson, but also of a great many other writers, and our celebration this evening is going to include some of their versifying too, starting right now with that other giant of this genre, Edward Lear. Actor Polly March joins us from Malta. Welcome, Polly. Lovely to have you with us. And, uh, Thank you. It's lovely to be here. Well, there have been a number of projects that have brought uh, you and I together over the years, but none probably more immersive than the two-person show that I wrote about Edward Lear to see in a sieve with music by Dave Hewson, and which you and I performed uh, here at the Edinburgh Festival Fringe um, mm. in 1989 and then later at London's Westminster Theatre. Uh, as the old song says, do you remember it well? <laughs> I do remember it well. It was it was one of those one of those moments you have in, in your working life as an actor where you know that you've you've got a chance to extend yourself, to test yourself. I, I mean, thank you, Brian. I cr I think I played twenty seven characters, <laughs> ranging from Queen Victoria to a parrot. So you know, you you could say I I ran the gamut from A to B, really. But um, and and poor David had to put up with the fact that I'm I'm not really a singer, so I sort of well, neither of us. <laughs> I said neither of us are singers. But uh, <clears throat> did you, in 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 the words of one of the the rhymes that you read did you find it pleasant to know Mr Lear I don't mean my Mr Lear but I mean Mr Lear the writer well your Mr Lear was very pleasant anyway um and yes I I, I love Lear and I'm, I think it might have been I don't know whether it was for Edinburgh or for the Westminster but you gave me an Edward Lear watercolor of a of a parrot which I cherish, it's up here on the wall, in very sunny and rather hot Malta. <laughs> well, as you said, you played uh, so many different parts. 
and 20, 32, 20, 32 years ago, you were among many other personas, the pussycat to my owl. But I'm leaving the whole poem to you tonight. It's probably Edward Lear's most famous poem. Uh, and you don't, you don't have to sing it tonight. So, but Polly, please read us the owl and the pussycat. Certainly, and you'll all be very relieved that I'm not singing. <laughs> the owl and the pussycat went to sea in a beautiful pea green boat. They took some honey and plenty of money wrapped up in a five pound note. The owl looked up to the stars above and sang to a small guitar. Oh, lovely pussy, oh, pussy, my love, what a beautiful pussy you are, you are, what a beautiful pussy you are. Pussy said to the owl, you elegant fowl, how charmingly sweet you sing. Oh, let us be married, too long we have tarried, but what should we do for a ring? They sailed away for a year and a day to the land where the bong tree grows, and there, in the wood, a piggy wig stood with a ring at the end of his nose. His, his nose with a ring at the end of his nose. Dear pig, are you willing to sell for one shilling your ring? Said the piggy, oh, I will. So they took it away and were married next day by the turkey who lives on the hill. They dined on mints and slices of quince which they ate with a runcible spoon. And hand in hand, on the edge of the sand, they danced by the light of the moon. The moon, the moon. They danced by the light of the moon. Polly, Edward Lear, of course, was specially famed for his limericks, a number of which Polly and I performed in To See in a Sieve, including, there was an old man with a beard who said, it is just as I feared. Two owls and a hen, four larks and a wren have all built their nests in my beard. And now Polly's gonna read us the short histories of three of Mr. Lear's ladies of note. There was a young lady whose nose was so long that it reached her toes. So she hired an old lady whose conduct was steady to carry that wonderful nose. There was a young person of air whose head was remarkably square. On the top, in fine weather, she wore a gold feather which dazzled the people of air. <laughs> there was a young lady whose chin resembled the point of a pin. So she had it made sharp and purchased a harp and played several tunes with her chin. Thank you, thank you, Polly. <laughs> we'll have more from Polly later. Uh, it's perhaps not widely known, but Lewis Carroll also wrote the occasional limerick, two of which Kevin Moore is going to read to us now. There was a young man of Oporta who daily got shorter and shorter. The reason he said was the heart on his head, which was filled with the heaviest mortar. His sister, named Lucy O'Finna, grew constantly thinner and thinner. The reason was plain, she slept out in the rain and was never allowed any dinner. <laughs> Tragic. Thank you, Kevin. The appeal of the Limerick has never lost its hold on our funny bones and if this weren't a pre-war watershed transmission tonight, uh, we might have included one or two more of the more scurrilous versions that are around. Well, a great many of them, of course. But let me introduce my next guest, Penny Morris, associate publisher at Macmillan Children's Books, uh, who are and have always been, of course, Lewis Carroll's publishers from the very first edition of Alice in Wonderland. Welcome, Penny. Lovely to have you here. Thank you for inviting me. Um, Penny, obviously you'll publish Lewis Carroll's books at Macmillan. Lots of other people do now, of course, because they're out of copyright, but uh, you've maintained that relationship as a publisher with Lewis Carroll. Um, how important are these books to uh, Macmillan as a publisher and, well, to, to everybody? And, and how important is it to, as it were, protect the, 
the original product because it appears in so many forms but it must be important to Macmillan to keep it keep the flame going as it were. Oh absolutely these are our heartland um, these books are absolutely the heart of Macmillan um, and you know have been for 150 more than 150 years um, and as you can see from the logo you know we, we are very proud to brand the books the Macmillan Alice to reinforce that connection with Macmillan. Um, and we do that at every opportunity. Um, and we also work very closely with other organizations like the, the exhibition that's at the VNA at the moment. We've cooperated closely with them. We've supplied some material. We have a wonderful archive down in Basingstoke um, and our archivist, Alison Saunders, supplies a lot of material to people who are doing research into uh, Macmillan and Carol and the relationship. Um, so yeah, as I say, it's at our heart and we spend a lot of time working to keep that bond between us and Lewis Carroll visible. And tell me personally, you're, you're, the photo we have of you there, in case you thought that Penny was a ventriloquist, uh, that's <laughs> a still photo and Penny is on the uh, on the gallery but um, Penny as a uh, as you as an individual apart from Millen have you always been a, a verse lover since childhood? Oh, absolutely I was lucky enough to grow up in the uh, be at junior school in the 60s when learning a new poem every week was what we did and um, you know it was James Reeves, Walter de la Mer, um, Robert Louis Stevenson, Christina Rossetti, and I have to confess, I still remember a lot of those poems, and at the drop of a hat I will recite them. My family used to get really annoyed, because every time we were on a beach I would start, The Rock Pool by James Reeves, In This Water Clear As Air Lurks A Lob You know, I just know them, and I love them. Uh, my mum was a poetry lover as well, and in fact I have her copy of uh, when we were very young, and I also have her Alice's from the 30s. Um, and so I was lucky, I was brought up in a house where poetry was appreciated and enjoyed as something to be read aloud and learned. And yeah, and I still do, as I say, remember a lot of it. Well, we've got an image here of a book which was uh, one of your father's books, Monster, <laughs> it's not the easiest title to say, by Uncle Mac, who, for those who are too young to know or live in foreign climes, was a much-loved BBC radio broadcaster and producer, real name Derek McCulloch. And uh, this was, these are eccentric little verses, really, aren't they? They are extremely eccentric, and quite a lot of them I, I would not want to read nowadays. They're not acceptable in any way and nor are the visuals but there are some that are and um yes I, I was going to read one yeah well this is the story of a, a lovelorn a lovelorn miss which uh whose name is carol sonia so i think we've got a picture with the accompanying illustration so yes um I mean, you, you can see lying on the floor there's a letter and it's obviously a letter that her beloved has sent her to tell her that he has um, married somebody else and she appears to be called Lady Harmonica Sinecure and he married her at Botany Bay on Pancake Day. And so um, this is how Sonia responds, or I should say Sonia, which is necessary for the rhyme. Said a morbid young Miss Carol Sonia, I'm about to take poison, ammonia. When they said have a heart, she replied, I'll depart. Her present address is Tombstonia. So it's a little bit morbid, but quite funny. That's great. Um, Penny Macmillan have a very strong poetry list. I mean, they're noted for their poetry books. And of course, you have a wonderful association with one of our upcoming guests who's here and busily drawing at the moment, uh, the great Chris Riddle. Yes, we do. We, I mean, we've had a poetry list forever. And in fact, um, one of our earliest publications as Macmillan was Paul Graves Golden Treasury. And this edition was published to celebrate Macmillan's 175th anniversary a few years ago. Uh, but that list is, uh, is so important to Macmillan across children's and adult. Gabby Morgan looks after the poetry now, and she's done this series with Chris. Um, the poems are chosen by Chris and illustrated by Chris. There are three in that series now. And we're really proud of those books and, and of our poetic heritage, which continues and is growing. 
uh, and of course, you also published last year uh, Chris's Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, and are about to, we're about to have it's it's due to be published this month, I think, um, through the Looking Glass. Yes, that's right. And, and earlier, the Hunting of the Snark. So um, we'll be yeah. hearing more about that from from uh, Chris shortly. Um, yeah. One one of the things that occurs to me about um, nonsense verse is that it's very much a property of young people, of young children, really, because there's such a long tradition of children's verses. You know, one only has to think of those old women living in shoes, being tossed up in baskets or swallowing flies. Uh, and also the, the, the nonsense lyrics of children's games. I mean, yeah. uh, yeah. uh, Peter and I own Opie who collected all those children's yeah. games so many years ago. So many of them are based on kind of nonsense ideas, aren't they? Absolutely. Uh, I mean, that's it, it sort of develops from nursery rhymes. So the very, very earliest rhymes that children hear, unfortunately, nowadays, many of many children don't seem to know them the way we all did. Um, but I really hope, um, you know, we can somehow reintroduce them to children. Uh, and they certainly do play with rhymes in the playground and they may not do them necessarily with skipping, but they do, you know, rhymes and, and made up verses and nonsense are still alive in the playground. Well, you've got a couple you're going to read for us now. You would like to introduce them and, and, and let us hear okay. them. Okay, um, well, the first one, is um, it's a sort of skipping rhyme and it's <clears throat> it's a family favourite, this one. Uh, it probably lower the tone a little bit um, of this meeting. We first came across it in my family in the early 1990s uh, from a book of poems collected by Michael Rosen. Um, and it's a real favourite in our house. Um, I had the German measles, I had them very bad. They wrapped me in a blanket and put me in a van. The road was very bumpy, I nearly tumbled out, and when I got to hospital I heard a baby shout, Mama, Dada, take me home from this little rusty home. I've been here a year or two and now I want to go with you. Here comes Dr. Dr. Brown asking questions all around. Are you ill or are you not? Yes, I am, you silly clot. Here comes Dr. Glanister sliding down the banister. Halfway down he ripped his pants and now he's doing a cha-cha dance. <laughs> and uh, you know my son who's in his 30s still knows that absolutely off by heart and in fact I sent him my typed version and he corrected a bit because I'd got one of the words wrong <laughs> <laughs> and what's, what's and the next one the next one um, it's got the same sort of rhythm as um, German measles in fact which is very common in English folk verse especially in nursery rhymes and uh, skipping songs. And this one was originally a skipping rhyme. I think it's it's more traditional, traditional from America. And there are lots and lots of versions and sung versions. If you go on YouTube, you can see many sung versions of this and, and a lot of them are rather bawdy. Um, and a bit of trivia, the rhythm is the same as the 1937 tune, The Merry-Go-Round Broke Down, that Warner Brothers used as their theme to Looney Tunes cartoons. So this is my favorite version of this one. Miss Lucy had a baby, she called him Tiny Tim. She put him in the bathtub to see if he could swim. He drank up all the water, he ate up all the soap. He tried to eat the bathtub, but it wouldn't go down his throat. Miss Lucy called the doctor, Miss Lucy called the nurse. Miss Lucy called the lady with the alligator purse. In came the doctor, in came the nurse, in came the lady with the alligator purse. Mumps, said the doctor. Measles, said the nurse. Nonsense, said the lady with the alligator purse. Penicillin, said the doctor. Castor oil, said the nurse. Pizza, said the lady with the alligator purse. That's why I like it. <laughs> Brian, you're muted. Thank you, Penny. That that was, that was really funny, and thanks for sharing those with us. Um, as as Carolians will know, the young Charles Dodson started his verse writing very early in life. And joining me to talk about this particular aspect of Dodson's personality is Caroline Luke. Caroline's a member of the society with a very personal co connection to our author, in that she is Lewis Carroll's great great niece. Caroline, welcome. Nice to have you here. Thank you. Caroline, did you grow up with memories being shared with your 
parents, grandparents about your great, great uncle Charles? <laughs> yes, my grandmother certainly had a few a few memories of um, being very young and going to visit him at Christchurch. Um, and she said that he had the most wonderful toy cupboard where he would bring out toys which they played with. Um, I think there was a, a bear that apparently used to sort of come across the floor grunting and um, she loved that. And then he used to, on a couple of occasions, he went and stayed with them in Hereford because her father, Skeffington, was the vicar of, um, well, several parishes in, in Herefordshire, but in the Golden Valley. And um, he often used to suggest to her that he took her for a walk to the post office or whichever the little shop was and asked her to choose a present for her mother, um, which she did, and, uh, and, then, and then would go home. Um, so, and then she used to go and stay with them at the Chestnuts quite a bit, but I'm not sure that she ever met Uncle Charles at Chestnuts. She was staying, I think all the nieces used to be asked to go there to entertain the aunts. Um, <laughs> There were, there were a lot of female uh, re relatives of Uncle Charles, weren't there? Absolutely, yes. I've, I've never asked you this, so this is an impromptu question, which is probably going to get a, a silly answer or a non-answer from you. But uh, is it is it are you Caroline because of Carol? Um, well, I think possibly I was going to be Carol apparently, and then yes, and then several of my grandmother's friends suggested. But no, they said, oh, at the moment, which was early 1950s, Caroline seems to be a more popular name. So that that's how it came about. But I presume possibly that was why I was going to be Carol. <laughs> uh, there we are. Um, the fascination with nonsense clearly began in young Charles's early days. His father, we know, had copies of Punch magazine, so he would have been aware of that would have probably been aware of uh, the Book of Nonsense by Edward Lear. Um, and as a young man, to entertain all these sisters that he had who grew into those aunts, um, he used to put together and edit family magazines, didn't he? Yes, definitely. I mean, the first one, as you say, is the useful, instructive poetry. Um, and then I think he, he developed one called the Rectory Magazine, which... Uh, although he was the editor, he several, well, a lot of the other sisters and brothers all contributed to, um, and even Aunt Lucy contributed to that. Um, but I think he got a bit fed up because gradually over the months, I think the the um, the donations of other other articles became fewer and fewer, and uh, I think he was left probably trying to write most of them. <laughs> Uh, yes, but the interesting, uh, you, you mentioned the title, Useful and Instructive Poetry, and, and indeed the, the, that, this homemade little family magazine that he wrote and illustrated, that's one of his little illustrations on the cover, was very much parodying the, the uh, moral and improving poems that were out there and that Victorian children were, be, were sort of made to learn by rote. Um, but, but he always does it in a totally... Uh, subversive way and you're going to read one of those poems for us now called Brother and Sister. Sister, sister, go to bed, go and rest your weary head, thus the prudent brother said. Do you want a battered hide or scratches to your face applied? Thus his sister calm replied. Sister, do not raise my wrath. I'd make you into mutton broth as easily as kill a moth. The sister raised her beaming eye and looked on him indignantly and sternly answered, only try. Off to the cook, he quickly ran. Dear cook, please lend a frying pan to me as quickly as you can. And wherefore should I lend it to you? The reason, Cook, is plain to view. I wish to make an Irish stew. What meat is in that stew to go? My sister will be the contents. Oh, you'll lend the pan to me, Cook? No. 
So the moral is never stew your sister. <laughs> Thank you, Caroline. <laughs> Many of the uh, poems in Alice's Wonderland Adventure are parodies of popular verses of the day, uh, including the How Doth the Little Crocodile, which Kevin read earlier. Uh, and it's the case that Lewis Carroll's parodies are now far better known than the poems that they parodied. Uh, one poem well known to Victorian children was Robert Southey's didactic verse, The Old Man's Comforts and How He Gained Them. Even the title tells you how tedious it was going to be to read that. Originally published in 1799, but in Lewis Carroll's hands, it turned into this. old father William the young man said and your hair has become very white and yet you incessantly stand on your head do you think at your age it is right in my youth father William replied to his son I feared it might injure the brain but now that I'm perfectly sure I have none, why I do it again and again? You are old, said the youth, as I mentioned before, and have grown most uncommonly fat. Yet you turned a back somersault in at the door. Pray, what is the reason of that? In my youth, said the sage, as he shook his grey locks, I kept all my limbs very supple by the use of this ointment, one shilling the box. Allow me to sell you a couple. You are old, said the youth, and your jaws are too weak for anything tougher than suet. Yet you finished the goose with the bones and the beak. Pray, how did you manage to do it? In my youth, said his father, I took to the law and argued each case with my wife. And the muscular strength which it gave to me jaw has lasted the rest of my life. You are old, said the youth, one would hardly suppose that your eye was as steady as ever. Yet you balanced an eel on the end of your nose. What made you so awfully clever? I have answered three questions and that is enough, said his father. Don't give yourself airs. Do you think I can listen all day to such stuff? Be off or I'll kick you downstairs. You are old father William, as set to music in 1870, so the year before the first publication of Through the Looking Glass. So this is a contemporary setting uh, by William Boyd in his book, The Songs from Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. And, that version was performed on a BBC radio programme broadcast 42 plus one year ago and sung by the late Anthony Mile at the piano with uh, fatherly contributions from, well, I'm sure you spotted it was me. Um, what's amusing is that Lewis Carroll's parodies are now endlessly parodied by others. Here's a 1932 poster for Guinness Stout where Father William tells his inquiring son in one of the verses, in my youth, said the sage, I heard many reports that Guinness brought rest to the brain, since when, if depressed or a bit out of sorts, I've drunk it again and again. And uh, what we're gonna hear now is uh, certainly a, a less self-serving parody chosen by long-serving Lewis Carroll committee member, Sarah Jardine Willoughby. It's by Eleanor Fargen, and was included in her 1941 verse collection, The New Book of Days, entitled, Lewis Carroll Came Here Today. You are wise, Mr. Dodgson, the young child said, and your forehead is getting a wrinkle, and yet you've so twinkling an eye in your head, 
I'm wondering what makes it twinkle. In my youth, Mr. Dodgson replied to the child, I acquired mathematical habits to keep my odd thoughts from becoming as wild as March hares and as frequent as rabbits. You are wise, Lewis Carroll, the child said again, and the college you live in is hoary. But if you've such numbers of thoughts in your brain, do you think you could tell me a story? My youth, if you must know the truth, whispered he, I kept these same thoughts very supple by letting my stories run quite fancy free. Allow me to tell you a couple. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, it's time now to meet another special guest, illustrator and cartoonist, Chris Riddle. And for this interlude, we changed the screen format, uh, what we've been using up to now. Well, there's Chris's, the cover of Chris's new book. Uh, and we're going to hand over the space to Chris for reasons which will soon become evident. Uh, last year, as I was saying earlier, Chris illustrated a fantastic new edition of Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. And this year, well, about any time about now, the companion volume is out. Uh, Chris, can we can you put on your your uh, uh, mic and then we can see you center screen, I hope. I'm I'm unmuted now. You're there, um, you're there and we can see you and there's a crocodile in a pot of cream. Yes, I've been having a lovely time actually just listening in. I, I hope Alberto <laughs> can hear us is all I'm saying. Um, <laughs> always possible. And um, Brian, I think you're looking especially lovely um, at the moment. I think you've been referred to as pre-Raphaelite um, in, in your looks. Um, and someone said something rather wonderful when we were setting up. Someone said, this is a bit like a seance um, as we were trying to get in touch with Alberto, which was a rather lovely sort of moment. Um, and uh, I, I, I didn't know what you were going to read, Brian, but you started off with Jabberwocky, which has got to be one of my favourite um, favorite, uh, of Lewis Carroll's poems. And I didn't know about crocodiles in cream. So um, I'm certainly going to have a look at that. I do know about Hugo and Sylvie, but, uh, and what a lovely reading of the, um, uh, the um, pussycat, uh, the owl and the pussycat, which now I can only think of as Brian and Polly. It's just, you know, it's now fused in my imagination. Um, and of course, this is Penny who um, I have to obey. She tells me what to do and when. Um, and uh, now I really want to check out the, uh, the alligator purse. This sounds like a very, very useful sort of childcare implement, um, which I think could just sort out all sorts of bath time problems. Um, but I would like to read, Brian, if I may, um, from my, I suppose, after Jabberwocky, my second favourite uh, of Lewis Carroll's poems, which is The Walrus and the Carpenter. Um, apart from being just wonderful, wonderful characters in their own right, I just, I particularly enjoy um, the sort of jokes in this. I mean, I love the, the sort of the, the, duel between the moon and the sun and the uh, shining bright on the billows. But as an illustrator, of course, one of the great sort of challenges that, that Lewis Carroll sort of throws down to any would-be illustrator of uh, the, um, uh, the poem is, is my favourite line, which is about the oysters um, having nice shiny boots. Um, and so I've tried to solve this particular illustrative conundrum by giving them um, stilts um, so they can both walk along the beach on their stilts um, and wear shoes, even though they don't have any feet. So here is the, uh, the edition, um, hot off the press, as they say. And uh, I would like to read, if I may, um, and there have been some fabulous readings, so do forgive my non-thespian rendering of, of this poem. Um, I promise there won't be singing. Um, and this is the um, Walrus and the Carpenter. The sun was shining on the sea, shining with all his might. He did his very best to make the billows smooth and bright. And this was odd because it was the middle of the night. 
The moon was shining sulkily because she thought the sun had got no business to be there after the day was done. It's very rude of him, she said, to come and spoil the fun. The sea was wet as wet could be. The sands were dry as dry. You could not see a cloud because no cloud was in the sky. No birds were flying overhead. There were no birds to fly. The walrus and the carpenter were walking close at hand. They wept like anything to see such quantities of sand. If only this were cleared away, they said, it would be grand. If seven maids with seven mops swept it for half a year, do you suppose, the walrus said, they could get it clear? I doubt it, said the carpenter and shed a bitter tear. Oh, oysters, come and walk with us, the walrus did beseech. A pleasant walk, a pleasant talk along the briny beach. We cannot do more than four to give a hand to each. The eldest oyster looked at him, but never said a word. The eldest oyster winked his eye and shook his heavy head, meaning to say he did not choose to leave the oyster bed. But four young oysters hurried up, all eager for the treat. Their coats were brushed, their faces washed, their shoes were clean and neat. And this was odd because, you know, they hadn't any feet. Four other oysters followed them and yet another four. And thick and fast they came at last and more and more and more, all hopping through the frothy waves and scrambling to the shore. The walrus and the carpenter walked on a mile or so and then they rested on a rock conveniently low. And all the little oysters stood and waited in a row. The time has come, the walrus said, to talk of many things, of shoes and ships and sealing wax, of cabbages and kings, and why the sea is boiling hot and whether pigs have wings. But wait a bit, the oysters cried, before we have our chat, for some of us are out of breath and all of us are fat. No hurry, said the carpenter. They thanked him much for that. A loaf of bread, the warrior said, is what we chiefly need. Pepper and vinegar besides are very good indeed. Now, if you're ready, oysters, dear, we can begin to feed. Not on us, the oysters cried, turning a little blue. After such kindness, that would be a dismal thing to do. The night is fine, the warrior said. Do you admire the view? It was so kind of you to come, and you are very nice. The carpenter said nothing, but cut us another slice. I wish you were, no quite, you were not quite so deaf. I had to ask you twice. It seems a shame, the warrior said, to play them such a trick. After we've brought them out so far and made them trot so quick, the carpenter said nothing but the butter spread too thick. I weep for you, the warrior said. I deeply sympathize. With sobs and tears, he sorted out those of the largest size, holding his pocket handkerchief before his streaming eyes. Oh, oysters, said the carpenter, you've had a pleasant run. Shall we be trotting home again? But answer came then none. And this was scarcely odd because they'd eaten every one. As a little coda to this, um, Brian, I um, was asked to do a political cartoon, that's my other sort of vocation, um, for the um, exhibition at the v &A, which has just started, of all things Alice. And I had to think a little bit about this, and, uh, and then it came to me, I thought, a perfect subject for the uh, walrus, uh, for the um, uh, cartoon would be the walrus and, and the carpenter. And so I drew a political cartoon, and in my cartoon, the uh, walrus, is Boris Johnson and the carpenter is Dominic Cummings. And it just seemed to fit so beautifully with uh, what's going on. Answer came a none. Well, uh, it's curious you should say that, Chris, because earlier today, uh, Caroline and her husband and my husband, David, and I were at the v v &A, uh, and saw that cartoon, which is absolutely splendid and couldn't be a better match for the, the two uh, protagonists you've just mentioned. 
Uh, it is an amazing verse that I, I learned it from uh, very, very early on and was able to quote it. And I remember in a bit showing off in a history lesson when I was at secondary school, uh, writing about the Second World War. And I, I, I wrote that uh, the Americans at last joined, came to, to the aid of the uh, Allies in, in the Second World War. And I quoted this by saying, and thick and fast they came at last. And when I got <laughs> back from my from my uh, history teacher after he'd marked it, he wrote in the margin, I don't know about fast, but they were certainly thick. Um, <laughs> I, I apologize to uh, all my American friends who are on this uh, Zoom call, but there you go. There's a bit of, a bit of prejudice from the 1950s. You're forgiven. Um, uh, you, you're, doing, you're, you're doing another drawing now because I wanted to ask you to read another one of the rhymes, but before, while you're doing that, um, I know that the books were really important to you uh, from your childhood and especially because of Tenniel's illustrations because I know that that had a huge impact on you as a as a young artist and an aspiring artist um read it, living as it were with Cheek and Jowl with Carol and Tenniel uh, over the last couple of years doing both of these books has your perception of the books your perception of Carol changed in any way has it developed uh, is it different to how it was Yes, yes, it certainly is actually, Brian. I, I think um, for me, uh, it, it was a very daunting prospect to uh, illustrate um, both uh, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland and also Through the Looking Glass, simply because they were so um, fixed in my mind um, and uh, Tenniel's illustrations were, were sort of um, so fixed. And I had to really just try and sort of move away from that and not think too much about the wonderful and the immortal uh, John Tenniel uh, and try and just sort of, you know, approach this as if Lewis Carroll had uh, picked up the telephone and, and commissioned me direct um, from beyond the grave and, and said, you know, would you like to do a new uh, anniversary edition? Um, and so what I've attempted to do um, over sort of 320 pages in each book is just illustrate everything that I can lay my hands on, um, going through the text rather forensically, um, and illustrate all, all the bits that, for obvious reasons, Tenniel couldn't quite get round to, because he had a limited amount of space um, to, to actually illustrate them. Um, and so it did allow me, I think, to, to sort of visualise lots of different things. Um, and the other thing that, that I really enjoyed when I uh, illustrated the editions was what we're talking about this evening, which was the verse, um, the wonderful, wonderful verse, and, and the way that it really does sort of capture uh, the, the whimsicality and, and, and the humour. And I think down through the years, the reason why uh, the books endure in the way that they have is because that humour is still as fresh as it was when it, it, it was written. It still speaks to us. And um, add some pictures, because what's the use of a book without good pictures and conversation? And you have the classics that we can still enjoy today. I think one of the intriguing things, and you probably feel this as well, because you must have seen many other editions uh, are subsequent to, to Tenniel's, uh, is that every now and again, illustrators suddenly find a moment which, as you say, Tenniel didn't get round to or just missed, uh, and they've seized on that. But the joy of, of your well, Wonderland and what I've seen of Looking Glass uh, is exactly that, that there is just so many opportunities that you've seized on that other illustrators haven't, and uh, it makes the books uh, a, well, just a, a visual feast and the way in which the text is woven into those pictures uh, is fantastic. Well, we saw a glimpse of that then. Anyway, you've been drawing Humpty Dumpty uh, and you're going to read us uh, now Humpty Dumpty's rhyme. And this is a really curious poem. I mean, it should be said that all the verses uh, in Looking Glass with almost the exception of the White Knight song, which we, we'll hear in a moment or two, uh, are original. They, they aren't parodies in the same way that they are in Wonderland. And this poem seems to me to be one that is, well, it's kind of absurdist poetry before people catalogued certain poems as being absurdist. 
I think you're right, actually, Brian. It, it is a little sort of gem, and, and it is inscrutable in many ways. Um, I would like to read it with the asides that, that Alice provides. Um, and also, if you'll indulge me, um, just a little bit of sort of primary research um, that happens towards the end of the book where we revisit Humpty, um, because that has been food for my imagination, certainly. I'll tell you a little bit about that when we get to it. So this is um, Humpty's rhyme. I sent a message to the fish. I told them, this is what I wish. The little fishes of the sea, they sent an answer back to me. The little fish's answer was, we cannot do it, sir, because... I'm afraid I don't quite understand, said Alice. It gets easier further on, Humpty replied. I sent to them again to say, it will be better to obey. The fishes answered with a grin, why, what a temper you are in. I told them once, I told them twice, they would not listen to advice. I took a kettle, large and new, fit for the deed I had to do. My heart went hop, my heart went thump. I filled the kettle at the pump. Then someone came to me and said, the little fishes are in bed. I said to him, I said it plain, then you must wake them up again. I said it very loud and clear. I went and shouted in his ear. Humpty raised his voice almost to a scream as he repeated this verse, and Alice thought with a shudder, I wouldn't have been that messenger for anything. But he was very stiff and proud. He said, you needn't shout so loud. He was very proud and stiff. He said, I'd go and wake them if... I took a corkscrew from the shelf. I went to wake them up myself. And when I found the door was locked, I pulled and pushed and kicked and knocked. And when I found the door was shut, I tried to turn the handle, but uh, there was a long pause. Is, is that all? Alice timidly asked. That's all, said Humpty Dumpty. Goodbye. And later on, this is a nice little sort of excuse for me, actually, to draw a hippopotamus. Um, and uh, there's, a, there's a lovely exchange um, about this where um, uh, the White Queen and the Red Queen are sitting side by side with, with Alice at the banquet at the end of the book. Um, and uh, she's sort of talking about um, Humpty Dumpty, which reminds me, the White Queen said, looking down nervously, clasping and unclasping her hands, we had such a thunderstorm last Tuesday. I mean, the one the last set of Tuesdays, you know, Alice was puzzled in our country's remark, there's only one day at a time. Just so, Green, Alice sighed and gave up. It's exactly like a riddle with no answer, she thought. Humpty Dumpty saw it too, the White Queen went on in a low voice, more as if she were talking to herself. He came to the door with a corkscrew in his hand. What did he want? said the Red Queen. He said he would come in, the White Queen went on, because he was looking for a hippopotamus. Now, as it happened, there wasn't such a thing in the house that morning. Is there generally? Alice asked in an astonished tone. Well, only on Thursdays, said the Queen. So this is the mystery, you know, the Thursday hippopotamus. Um, you know, there must be a, another sequel there somehow. Um, I want to know what the hippopotamus does on Thursdays. Um, he's obviously expected. I don't know whether it's in inclement weather or not, but, but uh, the Thursday Hippopotamus, Brian, possibly the uh, title of my uh, next novel. <laughs> excellent, excellent, Chris. Chris, thank you so much for that. And we really wish you a, a huge triumph with your new edition of Through the Looking Glass. Are you going to go carrying on drawing while, while, people, while we carry on reading? I'd be delighted to, well, Brian. Then, well, then we'll, check, we'll check back in with you a little bit later, shall we? Please do. Lovely. And thank you so much. And uh, as obviously, as you've seen from that edition, we're, we're celebrating 150th anniversary of, of Looking Glass. And we're going to hear that, that other poem that I mentioned this time uh, read for us by a um, past chair of the Lewis Carroll Society, Lindsay Fortune. It's a story, it's a poem with many names, but Lindsay will explain that to us when she reads it. I think 
Lewis Carroll can probably explain it even better. So if you bear with me, I'm just going to read a part of the chapter before we get to the wonderful poem. You are sad, the knight said in an anxious tone. Let me sing you a song to comfort you. Is it very long? Alice asked, for she had heard a good deal of poetry that day. It's long, said the knight, but it's very, very beautiful. Everybody that hears me sing it, either it brings tears into their eyes or else. Or else what? said Alice, for the knight had made a sudden pause. Or else it doesn't, you know. The name of the song is called Haddock's Eyes. Oh, that's the name of the song, is it? Alice said, trying to feel interested. No, you don't understand, the knight said, looking a little vexed. That's what the name is called. The name really is the aged, aged man. Then I ought to have said, that's what the song is called, Alice corrected herself. No, you oughtn't. That's quite another thing. The song is called Ways and Means. But that's only what it's called, you know. Well, what? Is the song then, said Alice, who was by this time completely bewildered. I was coming to that, the knight said. The song really is a sitting on a gate and the tunes my own invention. I'll tell thee everything I can. There's little to relate. I saw an aged, aged man a sitting on a gate. Who are you, aged man? I said, and how is it you live? His answer trickled through my head like water through a sieve. He said, I look for butterflies that sleep among the wheat. I make them into mutton pies and sell them in the street. I sell them unto men, he said, who sails on stormy seas, and that's the way I get my bread a trifle, if you please. But I was thinking of a plan to dye one's whiskers green and always use so large a fan that they could not be seen. So, having no reply to give to what the old man said, I cried, come tell me how you live, and thumped him on the head. His accents mild took up the tale. He said, I'll go my ways, and when I find a mountain rill, I'll set it in a blaze. And thence they make a stuff they call Roland's Macassar oil. Yet tuppence halfpenny is all they gives me for my toil. But I was thinking of a way to feed oneself on batter, and so go on from day to day getting a little fatter. I shook him well from side to side until his face was blue. Come tell me how you live, I cried, and what it is you do. He said, I hunt for haddock's eyes among the heather bright and work them into waistcoat buttons in the silent night. And these I do not sell for gold or coin of silvery shine, but for a copper halfpenny, and that will purchase nine. I sometimes dig for buttered rolls or set lime twigs for crabs. I sometimes search the grassy knolls for wheels of handsome cabs. And that's the way, he gave a wink, by which I get my wealth, and very gladly will I drink your honour's noble health. I heard him then, for I had just completed my design to keep the men I bridge from rust by boiling it in wine. I thanked him much for telling me the way he got his wealth, but chiefly for his wish that he might drink my noble health. And now, if e'er by chance I put my fingers into glue, or madly squeeze a right-hand foot into a left-hand shoe, or if I drop upon my toe a very heavy weight, I weep, for it reminds me so of that old man I used to know, 
whose look was mild, whose speech was slow, whose hair was whiter than the snow, whose face was very like a crow, with eyes like cinders all aglow, who seemed distracted with his woe, who rocked his body to and fro, and muttered mumblingly and low, as if his mouth was full of bro, who snorted like buffalo. That summer evening, long ago, a sitting on a gate. Thank you, Lindsay. Uh, it's my great pleasure now to welcome the writer, Alberto Manguel. Uh, I'm so glad that you're with us now, Alberto. I'm sorry we had, had uh, difficulties at the beginning to contact you, but I, it's great that you're here. Um, Alberto is the author of A History of Reading, A Reader on Reading, A Visit to the Dream Bookseller, and, well, actually, an entire library of books. Uh, I don't think it's much of an exaggeration to say that Alberto has written more books in his lifetime than most of us have read in ours. He's an expert on Robert Louis Stevenson, Homer, Borges, among many others. Uh, frequently, Alberto's books evoke Lewis Carroll, uh, included in such titles as the one you can see here, Into the Looking Glass Wood, very imaginatively arranged by the publisher to have uh, a looking glass uh, reversal on the back. Uh, and this book recently uh, published uh, called Fabulous Monsters, Dracula, Alice, Superman and Other Literary Friends. Uh, it's, it's a delight to have you with us, Alberto. Um, the, the, tell me, the Alice books pop up quite a lot in your writings. Whenever you get an opportunity, it seems to me, you, you mention them. How important is Lewis Carroll in your book universe? Enormously. Um, I... I think I grew with Alice and Alice has accompanied me all, all my life. Um, I find that every stage uh, I find in, in the Alice books part of my autobiography, whether it was as an adolescent bewildered by the absurd rules and, and sayings of the adults and then later when I uh, became mildly political in Argentina. Um, uh, the Alice book spoke to me as when the, the Mad Hatter says that there's no room at the table and Alice, as myself, would say, but of course there's a lot of room and uh, you are just being capitalistically greedy. Um, and, and so on. Uh, I, I, I kept reading Alice. I read Alice today. And it's um, my, the comfort food of, of my old age. There's so much intelligence in those books. And, and they keep popping up everywhere. Um, uh, uh, Chris mentioned uh, the possibility of writing a novel called the uh, Thursday Hippopotamus, which seems to me a brilliant idea, and I hope he does. But for instance, um, the Argentinian writer, uh, Silvino Campo, a friend of Borges, wanted to write a detective novel based on the line of the, um, uh, the walrus and the carpenter, uh, where the oyster says, a dismal thing to do. Such a brilliant title for a detective novel. And, and Agatha Christie um, used Come Tell Me How You Live um, for her autobiography. So Carol is, is still alive. And I've just translated um, a, a detective novel by uh, Guillermo Martinez, um, The Oxford Murders, that's based on a society like yours. So uh, I, I, I hope you won't feel offended when uh, Martinez tells that uh, you might be connected to a murderous plot. <laughs> I'm sure we won't be offended at all. Um, something I would, we haven't had a chance to talk before the meeting, but um, something that's always intrigued me is my own fascination uh, with Alice's Adventures in Wonderland began before I could read, but something about the book really attracted me when it was read to me. And I just kept asking, uh, unfortunate relatives who visited 
over and over again to read it to me, read it to me. And of course, like all children, knew the story better than the readers. And therefore, if they tried to turn two pages, uh, I picked them up on it, even though at that point I couldn't read. But I'm fascinated by the fact that as a young boy, uh, I, I never thought of this in any sense as being a girl's story. Um, and I related to Alice in a way that I've never later related to, say, Heidi or Katie or M Mary Lennox in, in The Secret Garden. Um, is this a common thing, do you think, that this, this, although she is quite clearly a little girl, somehow or other she has uh, an asexual appeal? Um. Well, um, they say that she didn't have an asexual appeal for Carol himself, but um, I, I never thought of Alice in terms of gender. Um, Alice was a, a, a child, an adolescent such as myself, and uh, she has this intelligence that a child wants to have or an adolescent wants to have in the world of adults. Uh, our world is a mad world. The, the Cheshire Cat says it so clearly. We are all mad here. And uh, it, it, had you not been mad, you wouldn't have come. So <laughs> that's a proof that, 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 that we are mad. Um, so, no, I never thought of, or, or thought of Alice as in, in terms of gender. Heidi and, and, and the others have a, a, a very obnoxious little girl quality of the goody goody girl. Um, uh, I'm thinking of uh, uh, Saki's story uh, of the storyteller where he. Uh, makes up this, this the, the narrator makes up this story for, for children about children who were horribly good and so they suffer the, the, the consequences of being horribly good and Heidi seems to me horribly good. Um, but Alice is not horribly good and, and she stands up for logic. When, when she questions the, the rules of the court uh, it's uh, an absolutely logical question that uh, if it's the oldest rule in the book, it should be rule number one. And she won't take absurdity sitting down. That's absolutely true. Now, we've been talking about Alice, but in fact, your choice of poem this evening is not from either of the Alice books. In fact, it's from the Sylvia and Bruno books, the, this particular poem you're going to read is, is dotted in, as separate stanzas through uh, the two books. Um, tell me a little bit about it. It's, it's, uh, it's called He Thought He Saw an Elephant, but uh, wh why did you choose it? What is it you like about it? First of all, I, I thought that um, you Carolians um, would have chosen all the great nonsense poems in the Alice books and there would be none left for me. Um, and so I thought of Sylvia and Bruno, which I like very, very much. Pe people don't seem to appreciate uh, the humor and the intelligence of, of both Sylvia and Bruno and Sylvia and Bruno continued. Um, and it's true that it doesn't have the narrative flow of, of the Alice books, but th those are miraculous. But it has so much uh, intelligent humor and uh, so many brilliant episodes and, and uh, ideas. The idea, for instance, that in, in the future, uh, all books will have been written and so you would not ask uh, uh, what book will I write, but which book will I write, which is a very Borghesian idea. It's Borges's idea of Pierre Menard, author of the Quixote. Um, and in, in, in our time, I think that uh, with the, the absurdities present in our life more and more, the QAnon, the fake news, uh, characters uh, like the unmentionable politicians that govern us, um, 
nonsense lags behind, but in Sylvie and Bruno, there is a confidence in the absurdity of logic that um, helps me to withstand the absurdity of everyday life. Well, there's plenty of absurdities in the poem you're going to read, so uh, let's enjoy it. Thank you, Alberto. As you said, these are, are, are verses scattered throughout the books uh, and they are come together as what is called the Mad Gardener's Song. He thought he saw an elephant that practiced on a fife. He looked again and found it was a letter from his wife. At length, I realize, he said, the bitterness of life. He thought he saw a buffalo upon the chimney piece. He looked again and found it was his sister's husband's niece. Unless you leave this house, he said, I'll send for the police. He thought he saw a rattlesnake that questioned him in Greek. He looked again and found it was the middle of next week. The one thing I regret, he said, is that it cannot speak. He thought he saw a banker's clerk descending from the bus. He looked again and found it was a hippopotamus. If this should stay to dine, he said, there won't be much for us. He thought he saw a kangaroo that worked a coffee mill. He looked again and found it was a vegetable pill. Were I to swallow this, he said, I should be very ill. He thought he saw a coach and four that stood beside his bed. He looked again and found it was a bear without a head. Poor thing, he said, poor silly thing. It's waiting to be fed. He thought he saw an albatross that fluttered round the lamp. He looked again and found it was a penny posted stamp. You'd best be getting home, he said. The nights are very damp. He thought he saw a garden door that opened with a key. He looked again and found it was a double rule of three. And all its mystery, he said, is clear as day to me. He thought he saw an argument that proved he was the Pope. He looked again and found it was a bar of mottled soap. A fact so dread, he faintly said, extinguishes all hope. Alberto, thank you very much for that. Um, and the illustrations, for those who may not be familiar with them, uh, are from the two uh, Bruno and uh, Sylvia and Bruno books and are by Harry Furness. Uh, and maybe maybe we provided incentive to those of you who haven't read the books or at least read the verses that are in them because there are a number of poems and uh, some very humorous verses and, and as Alberto says some wonderful um, logical uh, conundrums uh, please maybe look it out and, and, and have a go don't be too daunted but I want to take this moment just to make the exciting announcement that Alberto Manguel it's going to be presenting the Lewis Carroll Society's Roger Lutzing Green Memorial Lecture this year via Zoom on the 21st of July at 7 p.m. We hope you'll join us and uh, it's uh, very exciting that you're going to be with us for that, uh, Alberto. Um, right now we're going to take a discursive diversion to consider a few other nonsense versifiers some of whom were definitely inspired, inspired by Lewis Carroll, beginning with the writer and illustrator Mervyn Peake, who illustrated both Alice books and The Hunting of the Snark. Peake's own nonsense verse appears in various places in his work, including a nursery rhyme for The Lady Fuchsia in Titus Grown. And a number of them were gathered together into this volume, Rhymes Without Reason. Uh, David Weeks is going to read three short poems from Rhymes Without Reason, accompanied, of course, by Peake's own fantastical and wildly colourful illustrations. Thank you, David. 
all over the lilac brine. Around the shores of the arrogant isles, where the catfish bask and purr, and lick their paws with adhesive smiles, and wriggle their fins of fur. With my wife in a dress of mustard and cress, on a table of their design, we skim and we fly neath a fourpenny sky all over the lilac brine. My Uncle Paul of Pimlico. My Uncle Paul of Pimlico has seven cats as white as snow who sit at his enormous feet and watch him as a special treat play the piano upside down in his delightful dressing gown. The firelight leaps, the parlour glows, and while the music ebbs and flows, they smile while purring the refrains at little thoughts that cross their brains. I've lost the bookmark. No? Where's it gone? Oh. Upon my golden backbone. Upon my golden backbone, I float like any cork that hasn't yet been washed ashore or swallowed by a shark. I never seem to want to snarl in jungles all day long. I've been so much upon my back, my legs aren't very strong. It's all because a pelican I didn't eat one day decided to look after me that I behave this way. And so, while other tigers slink from tree to tree to tree, I lie upon my back and blink in aqueous ecstasy. David, thank you very much. I love that, I love that picture. I love the orange, orange sea, wonderful. Uh, joining us now from the United States is Charlie Lovett, a member of both the UK and the US Lewis Carroll Societies and a considerable Carolian scholar whose forthcoming book, Lewis Carroll Formed by Faith, is a study of the Reverend Dodson's religious life. Um, it, you know, it's an aspect of, of Carroll's life which permeates, obviously, uh, his story, but which is one which perhaps hasn't had uh, the particular um, uh, attention that it deserves. And it's great to the Charlie's book will do that. Um, Charlie, your first choice for us this evening is a, a charming piece of, well, nursery nonsense by a man who was often referred to as America's poet of childhood, uh, Eugene Field. Yes, I, I, I wanted to read something American, you know, because I thought we might as well put that in there. And I happen to have, I don't know how well you can see this, this is a copy of the 1866 Macmillan Alice. So it's the first sort of publicly published edition of Alice in Wonderland. And this particular copy uh, belonged to Eugene Field and his, is signed by him on the, on the title page. And then put with that was, I have, have my grandfather's copy of Eugene Field's uh, Poems of Childhood illustrated by the great uh, Maxfield Parrish. And so with those two books on my shelf, I thought this would be, um, an appropriate choice. And it's also a, a poem that, uh, like so much of Carol's work, explores to a certain extent the that sort of narrow line between waking and sleeping and dream and reality. And it's called uh, Winken, Blinken, and Nod. Winken, Blinken, and Nod one night sailed off in a wooden shoe, sailed on a river of crystal light into a sea of dew. Where are you going? And what do you wish? The old men, Moon asked the three. You've come to fish for the herring fish that live in this beautiful sea. Nets of silver and gold have we, said Winken, Blinken, and Nod. The old Moon laughed and sang a song as they rocked in the wooden shoe and the wind that sped them all night long ruffled the waves of dew. The little stars were the herring fish that lived in the beautiful sea. 
Now cast your nets wherever you wish. Never afraid are we, so cried the stars to the fishermen three, winkin, blinkin, and nod. All night long their nets they threw to the stars in the twinkling foam, then down from the skies came the wooden shoe, bringing the fishermen home. It was all so pretty a sail, it seemed, as if it could not be. And some folk thought it was a dream they dreamed of sailing that beautiful sea. But I shall name you the fishermen three, Winken, Blinken, and Nod. Winken and Blinken are two little eyes, and Nod is a little head. And the wooden shoe that sailed the skies is the wee one's trundle bed. So shut your eyes while mother sings of wonderful sights that be, and you shall see the beautiful things as you rock in the misty sea, where the old shoe rocked the fishermen three, winkin, blinkin, and nod. Thank you, Charlie. Um, absolutely lovely. And uh, Maxfield Parrish, fascinating artist. Uh, we, we have only one of his pictures there, but um, a glorious kind of feeling of childhood uh, captured there in, in both the words and the image. Um, you're also going to share, uh, very different, but um, a, a handful of animal verses by the ever ingenious Ogden Nash, uh, all of which I believe are creatures with, how can we put it, um, Corollian connection? <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll leave you to introduce them. Well, I, I thought, uh, you know, I grew up with, with mostly British nonsense verse in my household. We grew up with Lewis Carroll and A.A. A. Milne and, and some nonsense verse and songs that I'm not quite sure where they came from. Um, but but Nash, I think his closest parallel in, in our household growing up would have been the Flanders and Swan animal songs, um, which were great favorites of, of mine growing up. And I, my wife asked me about them this afternoon in the car and I uh, started singing the warthog as we were driving down the street. Um, but, but Nash has a couple of, uh, has another sort of British connection as well. In addition to sort of doing nonsensical songs about animals he invents words as Lewis Carroll did, and we'll hear a couple of those. Um, but one of these pieces, the one called Tortoises, um, which I'll be reading right after I read The Turtle, because it seemed appropriate to do both of those, uh, was actually written to be read by Noel Coward, another great um, British wit, uh, as part of a recording of Camille Saint-Saëns' Carnival, Carnival of the Animals. And that recording is actually available on YouTube. So if you go and you search um, Carnival of the Animals, Noel Coward, Ogden Nash, you'll, you'll come across it. It's quite wonderful. I will not pretend to be able to read nearly as well uh, as Noel Coward, but I will do my best. Uh, so these are four short uh, poems by Ogden Nash um, about animals, some of whom finally made their way into Lewis Carroll's works, but the first of which didn't quite make it. It's called The Wasp. The wasp and all his numerous family I look upon as a major calamity. He throws open his nest with prodigality, but I distrust his waspitality. Next we have the turtle. The turtle lives twixt plated decks which practically conceal its sex. I think it clever of the turtle in such a fix to be so fertile. And one can't read about turtle without reading about tortoises. And this is the bit from, from Camille Saint-Saëns, tortoises. Come crown my brow with leaves of myrtle. I know the tortoise is a turtle. Come carve my name in stone immortal. I know the tortoise is a turtle. I know to my profound despair, I bet on one to beat a hare. I also know I'm now a pauper because of its tortly, turtly, torpor. And in case that one was a bit too long, here's the one about the eel that we just saw recently perched on Father William's nose. I don't mind eels except as meals and the way they feels. <laughs> that was great, Charlie. Thank you so much. <laughs> I, I think my favorite Ogden Nash animal poem is, is the kangaroo. I'm sure you know it. Yeah, the yeah. kangaroo can jump incredible. He has to jump because he's edible. I could not eat a kangaroo, but many fine Australians do. And those with cookbooks as well as boomerangs 
prefer him in tasty kangaroo meringues. <laughs> And uh, thank you for mentioning uh, Michael Flanders and Donald Swan, who I, in my running order here, I had a little note to just give a call out to their wonderful um, zany songs, The, the Water I, I, I Adore. And I'm also very really fond of I'm a GNU, spelt G-N-U, the nicest work of nature in the zoo. I'm a GNU, how do you do? You really ought to know who's who. Um, and we stay now with very British nonsense as Jean Folan reads us a couple of very goonish poems from the great Spike Milligan's book, Silly Verse for Kids. Over to you, Jean. Oh, and by the way, the illustration, uh, which is from uh, um, the Fiona Fullerton film of Alice in Wonderland, that is Spike Milligan on the right as the griffin, but we were not suggesting that uh, that was you on the left. <laughs> I'm jolly glad to hear. Thanks. Thanks very much, Brian. And uh, so I'm going to read two of um, Spike Milligan's poems. So the first one, On the Ning Nong Nang. On the Ning Nang Nong, where the cows go bong, and the monkeys all say boo. There's a Nong Nang Ning, where the trees go bing, and the teapots jibber jabber do. On the Nong Ning Nang, all the mice go clang, and you just can't catch them when they do. So it's Ning Nang Nong, cows go bong, Nong Nang Ning, trees go ping, Nong Ning Nang, the mice go clang. What a noisy place to belong! It's the Ning Nang Ning Nang Nong. The second poem is Bum. Things that go bump in the night should not really give you a fright. It's the hole in each ear that lets in the fear, that and the absence of light. <laughs> Thank you, Jean. That's great. Um, well, many, many rounds of applause for being able to get your Ning Nong Ning. <laughs> you did Nang give me a challenge there, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> well, next we have a, a recording of the idiosyncratic Ivor Cutler, if you, if you know of his work, if you don't seek him out. And a piece of nonsense chosen by Jane Skelly, the secretary of the Lewis Carroll Society. It's called, quite simply, Fish. Fish. Fish are not very bright, not by my standards. They never had any reason to grow brains. For one thing, it's hard to read underwater, and paper gets too wet to handle, and there isn't the light. And fins let books slip, and you'd have to hold the pen in your mouth. People who say, a school of fish, are taking advantage of their limited intelligence to poke cruel fun. You let fish be, or eat them. There you have it. I can't resist mentioning what is claimed to be the world's shortest poem. Perhaps somebody can uh, prove that wrong. But uh, the already quoted Ogden Nash by uh, Charlie and myself uh, wrote this little piece. It's called Ode to a Goldfish. <clears throat> Ode to a goldfish. Oh, wet pet. Yeah, that's it. Three words. <laughs> <laughs> well, we take a, a surprising change of direction now with the first choice of Steve Folan, chair of the Lewis Carroll Society, who's going to read a pop music lyric that certainly enters the realm of nonsense. Life is a Minestrone is a 1975 song by Lol Cream and Eric Stewart of the rock band 10CC. Take it away, Steve. Okay. I'm, I've been told by my wife not to sing it, so the problem is I can hear the tune in the back of my head as I'm talking through it. So, I'm dancing on the White House lawn, sipping tea by the Taj Mahal at dawn, hanging round the gardens of Babylon. Minnie Mouse has got it all sewn up. She gets more fan mail than the Pope. She takes the mickey out of all my phobias, like signing checks to ward off double pneumonia. Life is a minestrone, served up with parmesan cheese. Death is a cold lasagna, suspended in deep freeze. I'm leaning on the Tower of Pisa, 
at an eiffel of the tower in france i'm hanging around the gardens of madison and the seat of learning and the flush of success receives a constipated mind i'm like a gourmet in a skid row diner a fitting menu for a dilettante life is a minestrone served up with parmesan cheese death is a cold lasagna suspended in deep freeze love is a fire of flaming brandy upon a crepe suzette let's get this romance cooking honey but let us not forget life is a minestrone served up with parmesan cheese death is a cold lasagna suspended in deep freeze and so it is how true <laughs> steve thank you very much for that well we've really managed to cram quite a lot of nonsense into tonight's program but in truth We've truly only scratched the surface, not having mentioned Kipling or Belloc or W.S. Gilbert, A.A. Milne or T.S. Eliot, Roald Dahl or Dr. Zeus. So maybe there's room for an evening of more stuff and nonsense, or, or do I mean perhaps stuff and nonsense concluded? Well, we're nearly at the end, but I want to check back with, with Chris. So Chris, if you could unmute yourself and, and perhaps we could just let the screen go back to Chris so that we can see what he's been drawing, because he's been very, very busy while we've all been reading and listening. So tell us what you've done, Chris. I shall unmute Brian and yep. uh, to turn my document camera back on because it goes off after a prolonged oh, okay. period. Um, what a, it's a delightful, um, delightful evening this has been. And uh, I'm sort of, uh, right, I'm going to activate there we are um, and just do a rapid sort of rewind I think um, I uh, it's one of the great sort of pleasures to listen to poetry being spoken and just enjoy the uh, the way the words tumble out and I, I can sort of draw along with them so ways and means I've got to say is one of my favorite uh, uh, of the lesser known carol poems um and it's full of wonderful things but it it does remind me in a way that that lewis carroll sort of adds to our lexicon of political discourse so often words are i mean exactly what i want them to mean and jam tomorrow jam yesterday never jam today um i was intrigued um about uh, the uh, the lewis carroll murders I, I was wondering whether alice might in some future iteration murder heidi you never know um for being insufferable um and i thought i saw an elephant is a wonderful one i want to revisit that and and uh, the bear without a head i think was particularly fine um illustrated by the great uh, harry furness um Gormenghast Fuchsia, one of the great heroines, maybe even to rival Alice in her sort of almost inscrutability. Um, lovely to hear from Mervyn Peake. And Winkin, Blinkin and Nod was um, a, a lovely poem that I actually want to go back and, and read again and perhaps illustrate because it's such a, a wonderful sort of image. Um, the tortoise, the eel, the kangaroo, um enough said from Ogden Nash and how lovely to sort of revisit my childhood and be reminded of Spike Milligan um and again another lovely nonsense poem to, to revisit and Fish by Ivor Cutler I mean my goodness um writing with uh, a sort of pen in its mouth and what a lovely way to end this evening my, as my wife appears and says what's going on supper is ready um, I can now sort of point to this wonderful lyric of, of, of life is a minestrone, but even better, death is frozen lasagna, possibly, you know, possibly made out of an unfortunate horse. Who knows? Great, Chris, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. I, I, uh, for all the years I've known you, you're, you're wonderfully generous in the time that you give and the, the art that you share. And we really appreciate your being here tonight. And, and unexpectedly, because I didn't know that was going to happen, actually illustrating the evening for us. We're not quite at the end, well, we are, we're coming to the end, um, but what uh, we go back to the screen because we've, I've decided that the best way to end this evening's Gallimorphory is with two classic nonsense verses by those, I think, undisputed masters of the craft with whom we began, Mr. Lear and Mr. Carroll. First, Polly March is joining me to relive an item from our 
to see in a Civ show. This is Edward Lear's The Jumblies. They went to sea in a sieve, they did, in a sieve they went to sea, in spite of all their friends could say on a winter's morn, on a stormy day, in a sieve they went to sea. And when the sieve turned round and round and everyone cried, you'll all be drowned, they called aloud, our sieve ain't big, but we don't care a button, we don't care a fig, in a sieve we'll go to sea. Far and few. Far and few are the lands where the Jumblies live. Their heads are green and their hands are blue. And they went to sea in a sieve. They sailed away in a sieve they did. In a sieve they sailed so fast, with only a beautiful pea-green veil tied with a ribbon by way of a sail to a small tobacco pipe mast. And everyone said who saw them go, oh, won't they soon be upset, you know, for the sky is dark and the voyage is long. And happen what may it extremely wrong in a sieve to sail so fast. Far and few. Far and few are the lands where the Jumblies live. Their heads are green and their hands are blue, and they went to sea in a sieve. The water it soon came in, it did, the water it soon came in. So to keep them dry, they wrapped their feet in a pinky paper or folded meat, they fastened it down with a pin. And they passed the night in a crockery jar, and each of them said, how wise we are. Yet we never can think we were rash or wrong while round in our sieve we spin. Far and few, far and few are the lands where the Jumblies live. Their heads are green and their hands are blue and they went to sea in a sieve. And all night long they sailed away and when the sun went down they whistled and warbled a moony song to the echoing sound of a coppery gong in the shade of the mountains brown. Oh, Timberlo, how happy we are, where we live in a sieve and a crockery jar, and all night long in the moonlight pale, we sail away with a pea green sail in the shade of the mountains brown. Far and few, far and few, are the lands where the Jumblies live. Their heads are green and their hands are blue. And they went to sea in a sieve. They sailed to the western sea, they did, to a land all covered with trees. And they bought an owl and a useful cart and a pound of rice and a cranberry tart and a hive of silvery bees. They bought a pig and some green jackdaws and a lovely monkey with lollipop paws and 40 bottles of ringbow re and no end of Stilton cheese. Far and few. Far and few are the lands where the Jumblies live. Their heads are green and their hands are blue. And they went to sea in a sieve. And in 20 years, they all came back. In 20 years or more. And everyone said, how tall they've grown. For they've been to the lakes and the Torrible Zone and the hills of the Chankly Bore. And they drank their health and gave them a feast of dumplings made of beautiful yeast. And everyone said, if we only live, we too will go to sea in a sieve to the hills of the Chankly Bore. Far and few, far and few are the lands where the Jumblies live. Their heads are green and their hands are blue. And they went to sea in a sieve. Thank you so much, Polly. Maybe it's time to revive that show. The illustrations, by the way, were by Edward Gorey, himself a writer and artist of some of the quirkiest nonsense stories. And now to end what I hope has been an entertaining, if decidedly nonsensical evening, Kevin Moore is going to dance us off into the sunset with Lewis Carroll's The Lobster Quadrille. Thank you, Kevin. Will you walk a little faster, said a whiting to a snail. There's a porpoise close behind us and he's treading on my tail. See how eagerly the lobsters and the turtles all advance. They're waiting on the shingle. Will you come and join the dance? Will you, won't you, will you, won't you? Will you join the dance? Will you, won't you, will you, won't you, won't you join the dance? 
you can really have no notion how delightful it will be when they take us up and throw us with the lobsters out to sea. But the snail replied, too far, too far and look askance, said he thanked the whitey kindly, but he would not join the dance. Would not, could not, would not, could not, would not join the dance. Would not, could not, would not, could not, would not join the dance. What matters it how far we go, his scaly friend replied. There is another shore, you know, upon the other side. The further off from England, the nearer is to France. Then turn not pale, beloved snail, but come and join the dance. Will you, won't you? Will you, won't you? Won't you join the dance? Will you, won't you? Will you, won't you? Won't you join the dance? Wonderful, Kevin. Thank you. Well, we've we've enjoyed, I hope, this dance of nonsense this evening. My thanks on your behalf, those of you who've been here listening to all our contributors. And since that concludes the formal versifications and brings us to the finis, as it were. Uh, oh, there it is. I'll hand you back to our chair, Steve Folan. I'll just share my screen for a second. Jane and Steve and Lindsay and Sarah and Charlie and Caroline and Alberto and Polly and Kevin and Penny and Catherine and Mark and Chris and Jane and David. Oh, and me. Uh, so oh, thank you very much for all of that. Thank you. So I think that the, the formal presentation is um, completed, but yeah, so we have uh, the Roger Lanson Green Lecture in, on July the 21st, so um, I would say book early, um, I'm quite looking forward to that, um, like Brian I've read um, through the Looking Glass Wood and Fabulous Monsters as well. So I'm very, and actually I've read the detective novel as well um, that Alberto has translated and there'll be a review of it in the next Lewis Carroll review. And it, uh, and it is very funny. I mean, I think it's quite funny as well. And the Lewis Carroll Society is far less murderous than the, and the one that, uh, Guillermo Martinez has um, depicted, or, or at least at the moment. Uh, the, uh, what I'll do then is I will um, unmute everyone so that if there are any questions or um, observations, then people can. Um, yeah. Well. So now you can unmute yourself. There you go. Well, for me, it was certainly a gen uh, an enjoyable afternoon here in the United States. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. And I uh, forgive the uh, comment about Americans and. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> We just had a we just had a, a similar kind of a get together last week in the uh, Lewis Carroll Society in North America, but you know, hearing the in, hearing an English poet read by an English person somehow worked better. Well, we'll resist saying anything. You know, I'm right here, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it did work better in many cases. Mark Russell, would you agree with me? Mike Russell Richards. Well, I could equally say it's so much better to hear Ogden Nash read in an American voice. Oh, well, sure. But how many purple cows have you seen in Britain? Uh, I don't reveal well, that kind of information. The purple, the purple cow is Gillette Burgess, who's another one we didn't mention. Oh, but that was Gillette Burgess? Gillette Sorry. Gillette Burgess is very well known for the poem, A Purple Cow. I've never seen a purple <laughs> cow. I never hope to see one, but I can tell you anyhow, I'd rather see than be one. Be one. And, and, in, and indeed, indeed, when Alberto thought that we had probably collared all the verses already, 
uh, he was going to read uh, that particular verse. Um, uh, can I can I interrupt, um, uh, pre-Raphaelite Sibley? You um, may, you may say yes. Yeah. Just to say, um, Brian, can I send you these these uh, sketches, these yes. uh, very quick doodles, and feel free to distribute them, you know, to anyone in the society who would like them. That is very generous. Thank you, Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you, Chris. It, it's been a pleasure. I, I'm, I'm now leaving. Oh, thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you. Enjoy your supper. Thank Enjoy you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. The gent. Oh. <laughs> well, Alberta, I, I know you, you rejoined us. Um, Chris will be sending us the pictures, so your the self portrait is um, is available, or your portrait rather than self portrait. Can he hear us again? It's another he thing. He hear us, but um, he's on mute. Ah. I, I was going to just say how oddly opposite it was, Brian, to, to ask me to read some Lear. And here I am living in Malta, ah. where Lear spent, well, four months solidly, but often travelled back and forth via Malta. Um, and some years ago, I, I came over to Malta with a, sh with a play. We were staying at the Phoenicia Hotel in Valletta. And it was such a joy. They, in the hotel, they left us not only a chocolate, but a beautifully printed card with, with um, an Edward Lear illustration on it. Right, right. Which I, I cherished. I think I lost them in the move, but I cherished them for quite a while. <laughs> Well, he was, he was, of course, uh, a great wanderer. And, and I think that's something we, 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 we touched on in, in the play we did um, because he was all over the place, but uh, really, well, peripatetic, he, I think he referred to himself um, in one of his phrases. Um, but yes, and of course, wherever he went, he, he painted the most uh, wonderful landscapes as well. I mean, as well as the comic drawings, he was such an accomplished painter. Um, you know Auden's um, uh, sonnet or about Lear? Uh, I, I do, but I couldn't quote it. Can you quote it? And then I only know the end. He had become a land where the the cat comes to him and wants to dance with a spoon. It, it's it's brilliant. Yeah, absolutely. There's a wonderful melancholia about uh, uh, Lear's character. Um, which is is not shared, I think, by by Carol. They are they are quite different in in that sense. Yes. Um, and there's a despairing. You no, know, I mean, obviously there are happy moments with the owl and the pussycat, for example. Uh, they're happily enough. Um, but I was, I think, when we were talking about one of the poems you were going to read, um, uh, which was uh, a, um, a Spanish a Spanish poem, uh, yeah. you you were drawing the similarity between. Uh, the, the cat, that character, and the, the dong with a luminous nose. Yes, Cavido's um, poem about the man with a huge nose. Yeah, and and uh, yeah, it's very different, of course. But the the dong has that melancholy quality. But there is always the there's always the chance that people just don't get it. Um, Polly may remember that one of the reviewers in Edinburgh when we did our show said something about one of the poems that I didn't quite understand was the one about the dog with a luminous nose. <laughs> <laughs> At that point, one just has to give up. Uh, but, um, you know, the contrast between Leah rambling all over the world and painting, you know, in Egypt and Abyssinia and wherever he went, um, and Lewis Carroll, whose only, only one great adventure was, of course, to go to Russia, a significant uh, adventure, but um, the rest of the time contenting himself with Folkestone and Brighton and mm -hmm. Eastbourne. Um, but uh, you know, totally different lives. But two great people who, uh, two great writers who enhanced our wealth of poetry and particularly nonsense. Yes, Brian, I was interested that you mentioned T. S. Eliot uh, at one point because I have actually sitting on my desk. A letter from T.S. Eliot in which he writes, as for the book which you contemplate, I have come across in Walter de la Mare's Lewis Carroll, a quotation from a letter which Carroll wrote about the hunting of the snark. 
I am very much afraid, he said, I didn't mean anything but nonsense. But since words mean more than we mean to express when we use them, whatever good meanings are in the book, I'm very glad to accept as the meaning of the book. Yours sincerely, T.S. Eliot. I'm, I'm sure we all know that quote, but it's <laughs> lovely to see Eliot quoting it to a, to a colleague in a letter. Uh, 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 only, only having you here, um, Charlie. Well, no, actually, there could be several other people from the uh, American Society who would be able to sit here and suddenly put their hand on a uh, <laughs> <laughs> a, a copy of Alice that's uh, inscribed by uh, Eugene Field or a or a reference to Lewis Carroll in an original letter by T. S. Eliot. I love it. Amazing. Can I just share a little anecdote about the the Mad Gardener song? Yes, please. So this is this is by Edith Stevens. So in 1958, there was a radio broadcast with with various child friends who are obviously now now fairly elderly ladies, all 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 sort of talking about their their recollections of Lewis Carroll, and this one's from from Enid Stevens. So she says. During our walks, he was looking up all the mad gardener, all, all the mad gardener verses in Sylvia and Bruno, and there were far more of them than ever came into print. But when he found one that he he thought he really must print, he would scribble it down. And when we got back to the rooms, I was allowed to type it. Tremendous joy! Oh, wonderful! I thought wonderful. I thought Charlie would like to hear that in particular. That's great. That is great. And if Mark's there, and Mark's got to open his mic, uh, since we're talking about the Mad Gardener song, um, you, you had a, an observation on the uh, the albatross that, uh, not the albatross, the bar of mottled soap. Well, I mean, it's not really that interesting, but I'll check. I don't know, it. I think it is. Don't, 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 under, don't undermine the story after I've just built it up. <laughs> no, because I thought about this today, because I mentioned this to you in an email, and I thought about it today, and I thought, I hope he doesn't mention it, because it really isn't that interesting. And it I may be something... It. I didn't mention it. <laughs> didn't mention it. Maybe I'm going to tell it anyway. It may be something that, um, once you start me, it may be something that everyone knows, but possibly not, but... One thing I've always it's always occurred to me that nonsense is a relative thing. I mean, what makes sense to us today is nonsense to people in another world, uh, in another country or another time. And so when we look back at Lewis Carroll, some of those things that we think are nonsense uh, actually probably made some sense at the mm -hmm. time. So one of them is um, in the Mad Gardener song where it says he thought he saw an argument that proved he was the Pope. Now, I don't know if I'm just telling you something you already know but in logic now Lewis Carroll was studying researching logic in the last sort of 20 years of his life which is the time in which he wrote that Mad Gardener song in logic there's an interesting what well, to me an interesting uh, thing I suppose uh, for want of a better word where when you look at um, implications you say something implies something else Proposition A implies proposition B. Like, if it is raining, then the street will get wet. So there's an interesting thing in logic that says, well, what happens if A isn't true? And to jump to the point, the thing that's generally accepted by logicians and mathematicians is that a false proposition implies every other proposition, true or false. So you can say, for example, if zero equals one, then I am the Pope. Now, I'm not the Pope. You may be confused about this, but clearly, just to be sure, I'm not the Pope. So zero equals one implies a false proposition that I'm the Pope. And so this thing, I don't know where this started or where it became sort of generally known amongst people studying logic. But he thought he saw an argument that proved he was a Pope is clearly this this thing. Um, if you look it up, you can find quite a bit about Bertrand Russell, who kind of popularized this um, notion because he came up with a, uh, an explanation. The, the, the story is apocryphal, I suppose, but some student said, do you mean that a, when you say a false proposition implies every other proposition, do you mean, Mr. Russell, that um, Lord Russell, that, that um, if I say zero equals one, you can conclude that you are the Pope 
and Bertrand Russell's reply, or Uncle Bert, as I like to call him, he said, um, well, if zero equals one, then one equals two. And if you have a set of two people, me and the Pope, then you must have a set of one person. Therefore, I must be the, must be the Pope. So that's the Bertrand Russell. Now, of course, Carroll predated Russell by a few years, so he couldn't have heard this through Russell, but it was clearly one of those logical things that Carroll was looking at. But why I mention it is that when I said, when we look back at Carroll's work, some of what we see today as nonsense may actually have had some sense. Well, perhaps that's one of those things, except when you look at it, actually, the whole thing is rather nonsensical anyway. So it's, yeah, so perhaps it's more nonsensical than, um, than we would even think it really is today. So that was, the, that was just the point. Mark, can I just say something quickly? Um, I don't know if you've, you've seen the N.F. Simpson um, documentary by um, David Quantic. Um, Jonathan Miller sums nonsense up at the very end, and it's absolutely brilliant. And I would recommend it's available. I'd recommend it, everyone to, to watch it because it's, it's very, very silly. And there's some lovely Jonathan Miller um, ex extracts on there. So, yeah, he sums it up lovely. What, what is sense and what is nonsense and how do we recognise nonsense? <laughs> anyway, I just thought I'd mention that. And that's on YouTube, is it? I think it's on YouTube. Yeah. Oh, well, it's, it's if you just Google, it might not be YouTube, but if you Google David Quantic NF Simpson documentary, I think it was a. Uh, oh, I can't remember. Uh, I can't remember. The reality is the absence of alcohol or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I can't remember exactly the title, but it, it's very good. It's about twenty minutes long. 20 minutes, half an hour. But the summary at the end by Jonathan Miller is absolutely brilliant. Can I add to that? Um, um, when Mark was talking about the, the, the seriousness of nonsense, that we can read Carol's nonsense as something serious today, Chesterton summed it up in his lovely little essay on nonsense, saying that people who say that faith is nonsense will come up to the idea that nonsense is faith. My, my they call that a tautology. Yeah, I think my own observation, I mean, I spoke to Kenny Moore earlier on, and I love the, um, the lobster quadrille, you know, because every time I hear it, I think of the Jonathan Miller film um, when uh, Albert, two famous uh, um, what, what would you call them? documentary makers, uh, Malcolm Muggeridge and John uh, Gilgood. John Gilgood are you know are doing the lobster quadrille, and it's a you know it's a fantastic sequence. It's just um, so out of context and out of their <laughs> usual personality. Absolutely. On this, on this topic of faith and, and nonsense and equivalency, I mean, when, when the queen says to Alice, I believed as many as six impossible things before breakfast, I mean, what Dodgson did most days before breakfast was go to morning chapel. And um, you can certainly look at the litany or the, the liturgy for morning prayer and say that on a, on a logical scientific uh, mind, there might be six impossible things that one professes to believe um, when one reads the creed every morning, you know. Right. <laughs> That's a great comment. <laughs> I think a logician might say, what happens if you don't have breakfast? How many impossible things have you believed then? Maybe you're yeah, on a you logical... Well, False. That's like the, the people who, in America, I don't know if they do this in Britain, they, they come to your table in a restaurant and they'll say, um, you know, I'm your server. My name is Mark, if you need anything. And to which our response is, what, what's your name if we don't need anything? <laughs> <laughs> I think the curious thing about the Mad Gardner song uh, is it strikes me, you know, because he, he sees, he thinks he sees something and then he sees it's something completely different. Um, and it, it, it's like a he's like a kind of precursor to uh, the myopic Mr. Magoo in that whatever he thinks <laughs> he's seeing is absolutely not to that and something possibly more terrible and dangerous than than the thing that he thought he saw. You know, that's a, it's a great idea. 
I think that the furnace drawing of the albatross that looks like a penny postage stamp is just brilliant. The closer it's you look brilliant. at it, you see yeah. the perforations along the wing and the, you know, the queen's crown and, and uh, it, it really does, you sort of think, well, if I looked at that really quickly out of the side of my eye, it would look like a penny postage stamp or, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, Jean's just commented that we, we, we must remember to include some Pamers next time we do one of these things. I'm not sure where the Pamers would be known in America, but um, uh, a, a lady of um, re redoubtable fame and uh, still still writing little whimsical uh, rhymes for us today. So um, yeah, maybe that can be your your next task, Polly, to do Pamers for us. <laughs> yeah, I think Brian, we discussed um, even people like John Lennon, including yeah, absolutely. You. Yeah. Wrote poetry as well. You know, it's quite incredible um, the number of non-poet poets who you know who enjoy nonsense poetry. Yeah, and John Lennon, one of his albums of his own music, not Beatles music, um, went under the title of "Shaved Fish." So um, <laughs> you know, he, he certainly fits within uh, some of the fishy stories that we've heard this evening. Certainly, I try to. Um just as a little joke here, because I helped Brian with the slideshow tonight, I've been trying to think of a limerick that I could um, sneak in here somehow with, um, but when some, forgive me for this, it's the best I can manage, but forgive me for it. <laughs> there, there was a fine man named Sibley who spread joy on the world rather liberally. It gets worse. Um, <laughs> it's desperate, this, but I tried, I tried. There are there are few more amusing and none so infusing, not even the Vicar of Dibley. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. <laughs> I'll treasure that. <laughs> it was the best I could manage. If I thought about it, we, perhaps I should have sent some emails around to people saying, can you have a go at this and see if you can come up with something tonight? We can, we can add that into the next one where people have to supply people uh, as a cost of entrance you have to supply a limerick or, or maybe uh maybe as a yeah as a cost of entrance you have to supply an extra verse to the uh, mad gardener's song <laughs> yes <laughs> very good well, and actually that reminds me we still have um for the benefit of people who don't know we still have um, a lewis carroll writing competition in play until the first week in july and it's pretty similar to what Mark described. And the idea is um, to write a missing chapter of either Through the Looking Glass or Alice in Wonderland. And um, there are age categories, so everybody is allowed to, um, to enter on the website. And we are receiving um, regular entries from across, you know, across the world. I can't believe that it's 17 minutes past nine, but um, it, it ten. is. <laughs> ten. Oh, ten. Ten. We're an hour ahead of you. Ten for anybody ten. in Malta. But, uh, ten for us as well. I was panicking an hour ago when I looked at it. <laughs> well, it's been a great evening anyway, and, and, and thank lovely. you all for being here. Thank you for your contributions. And uh, there are the names again of those people who took part. Thanks for that, Mark. He says he helped with the uh, visuals. Uh, he he constructed the the PowerPoint for me, and uh, that was fantastic to have those images there. Uh, I think we've probably sort of run the gamut, but um, thank you, thank you all again. And uh, well, please come back and hear Alberto in in July because uh, I know he's going to be give a fascinating talk. And if people would like anybody would like to join the Lewis Carroll Society, which uh, I'm sure Steve would have said if he'd have got a moment to think about another commercially could have squeezed in, so I'll do it for him. Um, there are details on the on the website and you would be very welcome. And then, I mean, you can come to these events. They're not, we don't charge for them, but it also means that you uh, would get the publications as well. But um, it's been lovely to be with you and thank you to all of my friends and the many people who are out there who haven't contributed verbally, but have been there supporting us. So thank you. And I'll pass out those uh, those drawings to the appropriate people uh, when they arrive. Lovely. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Well done. Well done. Thank you all.
and none out from Walter. <laughs> Good, Good night, night, Walter. <laughs> Listen, it was, 40 it was 40 degrees today, you know. Yeah. I feel so sorry for you all. Yeah, well. I, I feel I have to say that Malta was our favorite entry in the Eurovision Song Contest. <laughs> my wife was very excited to hear someone was online from Malta. So <laughs> That big go, Destiny. I have to say, we, the powers that be spent 650,000 euro on the PR for it, which would have kept several theatre companies going for a year. Um, so, you know, yes, yeah, she's great. She's 18. And... Um, Big voice, big lady, you know, good egg. So thank you, yes. All right, and this is Walter signing off. Okay, okay. Well, I'm meeting you down now, unless anyone has any objections. Okay. okay. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.